thank you so much for tuning in. And probably a lot of you know me, but for those that don't, I am the REO queen. Um, I've been doing uh, foreclosures and short sales for probably since 2007. So I love it. That's my bread and butter. I would do them all day long. And um, so, yeah, I'm going to go over some basic information. I'm going to try to fit as much as I can into the time that we have, because it's a lot. I can go on for days talking about it, but I tried to summarize it and give you guys some golden nuggets to go by. And at the end, I'll provide you my contact information. So if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me directly and I'll be more than happy to help. Um, so let me share my screen. Hold on one second. Can we see, Kev? Are we good? Everybody can see? I can't hear, yeah? Yes, we can see, you're good to go. Awesome, okay. So let's get started. So foreclosure and short sales, there is a difference. And I wanna go back to the basics for you guys to understand because a lot of us wanna dive in and be these experts, but we don't go back to the foundation and the basics. So I kinda wanna touch on that first before we dive in. So a foreclosure is when, um, or a short sale process too, when a borrower mortgage or defaults on the mortgage and the bank, um, hold on one second. One second. Okay. Okay, so um, you have when the when the mortgage or the borrower defaults on the mortgage and the bank starts the foreclosure process, right? You even though that process has started, you could still sell it as a regular sale if there is enough um, equity in the property and all the debt is able to be paid off. You could still handle it as a regular sale. Now, if there isn't enough um, equity in the property and there is more debt than what is actually what the property is worth then you need to do a short sale which has to be a arm's length transaction you can't sell the property to the cousin the sister the brother it has to be an arm's length transaction um, there are cases where you could do a, a deed in lieu of foreclosure where you don't want to go through the short sale process you just want to hand over the deed to the to the bank and just be over with it, that's an option as well. And there are different benefits that a borrower needs to know that if you go through a short sale versus a foreclosure, which I'll show you on the next slide, what the benefits are. Um, when a bank forecloses on the property, they get what's called a certificate of title. And you can look that up in public records and I'll give you guys a link where you can see that information. So this is what I was talking about. And you can get this from any lender that you are working with. And it basically tells you with for Fannie Mae, FHA, VA, USDA products, what the uh, penalties are in terms of being able to purchase a home if any of these uh, things happen. And you'll see that with Fannie Mae on the foreclosure properties, if you foreclose, you will need to wait seven years to purchase. And if you do a deed in lieu or short sale, it drops down to four years. So that's something good to know because if you are going and trying to um, get that business, get the short sale business and work with people that are in default, that's something that a borrower has to know. And a lot of times they don't know that. So that's a big plus that may tell them, you know what, yeah, let's go ahead and move forward and do a short sale. So the foreclosure process, like I said, we're going back to basics because you guys have to understand how the foreclosure kind of um, works from the beginning. So when a borrower defaults and usually they wait about 90 days before the process starts, um, the bank's attorney files a list pendants, okay? And that's where it's public record. You can pull it up so you can see um, and you would need to go to your, for that day, for that county on where the property is located, that's where it's gonna be recorded. Um, this is basically the legal notice that puts everybody on record uh, that there is a pending legal matter. It will also have a case number, which that case number is very important because that's where you can look up the docket and kind of see the workflow of that case to see how much time you have um, in order to be able to get the short sale done. You know, are you running out of time or are you still good? Then there are other documents in between, but I'm talking about the most major ones where you'll have the foreclosure summary judgment. And that's where you will see the detail of um, basically what is owed 
up to the up to that point and it will list the total principal all of the interest the attorney fees etc so again if you are going to work with foreclosures these are all really important things for you guys to know and understand these documents and what's included in them so and it's all public record everything is there we have all the tools and resources to able to be able to get that information so there's no excuses then like i said once the foreclosure process is done there is a certificate of title that is issued okay now i want to touch on the certificate of title because i have a lot of people call me you know buyers and realtors they're like oh but the last sale sold for you know 122,000 and i was like well no that's not the sale that's just the um, amount monetary amount that's put on how many how much the doc stamps are going to be paid on that amount so that is not what the property sold for. The bank doesn't buy back their property. However, there's a bid amount that if it's not reached, that's basically the amount of doc stamps that they will need to pay. Now, an interesting fact for those of you that don't know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they are exempt from paying doc stamps on the deed. Um, however, the so when you purchase a, a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac property, basically the buyer will need to pick up that expense. Um, so if the foreclosure is not contested, it can be finalized fairly quickly, like in six months. Um, if contested, it could linger on forever. I'm sure plenty of you have come across that situation. Um, so we have resources and tools that you guys need to use. We have so many of them, but I would say these three, and now we also actually have Remind Pro. That's another amazing tool that you guys can use to research information, to kind of uh, data mine that info so that you can go after that business. But RPR, IMAP, Realist, all of those tools provide all the information that we would need without depending on the actual customer. Because a lot of times the customer will uh, give you some information that they believe is accurate, but a lot of times they're completely checked out from that process. So you kind of have to pick up the slack and you kind of got to you know run with it and get all the information. So again, all the details and everything is located within the tools that the Miami Association of Realtors provides to us. Um, so again, foreclosure docket, I told you guys before, that's a really important uh, tool for all of you that will be working with short sales foreclosures. This is where basically the case is summarized with all the documents that have been filed. Um, so you would go to the count to the uh, public records in the county where the property was located. So I gave you guys an example and we're limited on time, so I'm not going to go in, but I believe we'll be able to share the presentation, I believe. And so you guys can kind of play around with it. But this is a property that I want you to go through the exercise and you can actually click on this website here and this will take you to um, I'll show you and then I'll get out. So this is where you can actually search in for the case. So first you would look up. Let me see. Hold on. See, now I got out and now I can't get back. Hold on. <laughs> One second. Sorry, guys, but I got you. Let me go. Hey, sorry. Okay. All right. So we're gonna hit play. Okay, so that's where you would click on and that's where you would basically be able to pull up the docket and search. But before you do that, you need the case number. So in, to get the case number, you would go to IMAP. Sometimes IMAP doesn't pull up all of the records because if there was a quick claim deed did after the fact, then I go to RPR because RPR has more details. So that's why I mentioned it here. So make sure to go ahead and, and use these resources. So once you get the case number, you will go on here and you will be able to um, pull up the case and see the entire docket, okay? And so here you have the 
the CT or the recorded list pendants will have the case number. So when you go to IMAP, this particular one, if you click on it, you will see in part of the records for the deed, there will be a certificate of title. And when you click on it, you'll be able to see on the right side, the case number. Okay, so now to the fun stuff, because we, everybody wants to be successful in submitting an offer on the REO listings. So I kind of gave you some bullets and points on how to be successful. So first things first is read all instructions. A lot of agents, the first thing that they do is pick up the phone and they want to talk to the to the agent, the listing agent that's assigned to the property. A lot of times they don't even have their, their cell phone number listed for this reason, because agents don't read instructions. So first thing guys, make sure you read instructions because all of the information is listed on the MLS. And if it's not, then of course that warrants a phone call um, to ask certain questions. But again, please read all instructions before picking up the phone. Um, review the MLS listing. I have agents that call me all the time and they start talking about this property, not realizing that it's an REO. So the questions that they're asking me are totally not related and they could have avoided the phone call and wasted their time and my time um, in, in doing something that's a little bit more productive. So pay attention to when you are working with listings, there is a field called REO and it will say yes or no. Also, there's a short sale field that will say yes or no. And again, this may seem basic, but I'll, I'm, I keep getting to this day many phone calls um, that pertain to these issues without people realizing that, that it's an REO. Pay attention to the following. The remarks will tell you everything, especially the broker remarks. Also, remark, going back to the remarks, we have a lot of properties that we sell through Fannie Mae that are through auction and are occupied. We will put in the remarks you cannot view this property. We don't have access to the property. It is being sold occupied. And I still get people calling me, asking me for showing instructions. So again, that's a, a prime example of a waste of a time for everyone involved. Broker remarks, it will uh, specify on there how to make an offer. Um, usually, for instance, I do a lot of business with Fannie Mae properties. All of their properties are listed through HomePath. And all of the offers have to be submitted through there. We have the details on broker remarks stating this information. So, and also homepad.com is an amazing website. I highly recommend for everybody to check it out. Um, the, there's a home ready mortgage product that's available for first time buyers that actually you can uh, do an education program that's there and they can qualify to get 3% towards their closing costs. Um, for purchasing one of the Fannie Mae properties through homepath.com. And this is a great place because it also is a checks and balances. So for any people that um, may wonder, oh, was my offer submitted? Fannie Mae monitors this. So if you do feel like, you know, your offer wasn't submitted properly or anything like that, you can definitely reach out. There's a helpline and believe me, they investigate. Um, there's other websites as well that other servicers use, which is prop offers, auction.com, zone, hudhomestore.com. Again, the instructions will tell you what to do if you read them. Also, um, before you call the agent for showing, go ahead and click on showing time. A lot of agents are not doing this either. Um, financing type. So you got to know what properties qualify for what type of financing. So you would hope that the listing agent would know, or sometimes the bank directs us that even though the condition of the property is great and it qualifies for financing, it may say cash only. Um, that is not the case all the time, but if you do feel that the property can qualify for other type of financing, that would warrant a phone call um, and speak to the agent and see why other types of financing is not is is, is not acceptable. But again, you got to know what qualifies a property based on its condition. Um, occupancy. We will also put on there if it's an occupied property, it will say so in there. And then attachments. Attachments is a very important field, which you can find it on top of your um, on top of the MLS. There's different gadgets. And you can see the information there if there's any attachments. And again, the broker remarks will be typically um, will typically direct you to go there. So now you have um, you're ready to submit an offer. You your client is um, ready. Now you need to submit all the documents per the directions that are provided. So you have your completed offer docs. 
Um, and so Fannie Mae has their own contract. So make sure you follow the instructions there, which you can find on homepath.com. The proof of funds, make sure that they're dated within the last 30 days. Also the pre-approval letter as well, make sure it's within the last 30 days. And if you aren't sending the proof of funds, make sure that it's in US dollars. And if it's not, then make sure that you convert it to US dollars. Another thing that you need to keep in mind, so when you're communicating with your clients is that on cash offers, usually there's a 10% uh, deposit for the earnest deposit. And uh, on financing deals, that can vary, but on cash deals, typically the bank will want to see a 10% um, earnest deposit. If a buyer selects the title company, the seller will pick up the cost for the buyer's uh, owner's title insurance. I highly recommend that. And then your client can always get an attorney to review documents if they don't feel safe. Uh, but usually they use big companies. Um, it's not your mom and pop title company. So and we never have issues with that. But again, use your better judgment. But it's something to keep in mind if you want to save your clients some money. Um, if you are submitting an offer that is owned by a, 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 your borrower is doing it through a corporation, make sure that you include all corporate documents and all of the Florida corporations um, that are incorporated in Florida, you can find them on sunbiz.org and print out that information. So it's less work that the listing agent has to do. Um, very, very important, guys. When you're working with REOs, you may not get a second chance in submitting your offer. So you need to make sure that you put your best foot forward because you may not get a second chance. Um, so the offers that are complete, the offers that have all the necessary information are gonna have a higher rate of success. So if you follow this, the little, uh, it, the, the information that I'm providing to you, you guys are gonna be pretty well set to be successful in getting your offer submitted. Um, low ball offers on bank owned properties, I mean, don't even bother. It's not gonna happen. A lot of the properties that the banks are selling, they're selling for, Above, ask, above asking or you know, usually within a 10% bracket. So it's something to keep in mind. It just depends on the property. But if you have a low ball offer, you're probably better off telling your client to look for something else. Another thing that you need to keep in mind is that banks typically will not renegotiate during the inspection period. So don't think that, oh, let's put a high offer and then during the inspection period, we're gonna come back and renegotiate. That is not gonna work um, unless of course it warrants uh, a reduction. So what would warrant a reduction? Something that we could not see, something that your client could not see when walking through the property. So something, let's say there was uh, moisture found on, inside the wall that we didn't know, and now there's mold and all that stuff. Of course, if we have an inspection report and it warrants it, that's something that's going to be reviewed and a decision will be made. Fannie Mae Heckam, important things that you guys need to know when it's a reverse mortgage foreclosure. The value that's put or the sales price that's put is based on a value that's provided by a HUD appraisal. Okay. And that's, that's what, that's what determines the listing price. And for six months, which is marketable title period, we cannot reduce the price. Um, I've seen very few cases where we were able to get a few, a few thousand dollars off the, the property because the appraisal came in super, super high, but usually there's going to be no price reduction. So look at the information and it will say in, um, it will say in the remarks if this is a Fannie, if this is a reverse mortgage foreclosure so that you know th what to expect. Um, when a contract is expect, uh, accepted, congratulations, um, the banks will most of the banks will require a new contract to be executed with the accepted terms so that there aren't any scratch outs, initials, all that fun stuff. That's at least something that I do for any of my contracts that get accepted. I go ahead and I rewrite the entire contract. I send it to everybody and then everybody gets a clean copy. Um, so the earnest deposit for most bank, regardless of who's doing the title work, is going to be held by the seller's title company. I have maybe, a, um, maybe two investors that I work with that are hedge funds and they don't care who keeps the who keeps the deposit but usually some of the bigger players they do care and usually it's required to be held with the seller's title company so if that's requested of you don't be surprised that's just the industry standard for banks um, some banks even require that before there's a fully executed contract once a contract is accepted verbally um, or in writing via email or the platform that the offer is being submitted through, 
um, the earnest deposit must be sent because it's something that's required as either an escrow letter or proof of the wire transfer has to be submitted along with the package when submitting the offer. So as I mentioned before, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they're a government sponsored agency. They do not pay the doc stamps, they're exempt. So what does that mean? Buyer pays. So if you're working with these type of properties, that's something that is in the contract, but obviously a lot of us don't read the entire contract to note that. And then when it gets to the closing table, the buyer's like, why is this on my, on my side? Well, that's why. Um, also, when you're working with a foreclosed property, the misconception that I get all the time is that, oh, is there a past due debt? Is there all this stuff in the back that's not going to be clear? No. The bank will convey clear title unless they will provide a disclosure ahead of time letting you know what the issues are and that the contract is being, the property is being sold subject to those items that the buyer has to agree by signing a hold harmless, or there will be exceptions on the title policy. But that's not something that's going to be like, oh, surprise. This is something that's going to be provided before time, before you actually go under contract. Um, also, obviously, like with any contract, we have to comply with critical deadlines. So you need to be organized and making sure that you're aware of what those dates are. And if you do need to request an extension, make sure that you do it in a timely fashion and that the request is a viable request. You know, there's a reason behind it. Don't just send us an, a, an extension request asking for additional days without giving a reasonable reason. Also, some banks will charge a per diem if you don't close a schedule. Now, again, don't be alarmed by this because if you do legitimately need an extension because of ABC and it makes sense, they won't charge you a per diem. It's something that if it's because of a buyer's uh, default on something else that they didn't comply with in time, that's when it would apply um, because I do get a lot of buyers that are concerned with the per diem. But like I said, the banks want you to close. They, the per diem for them makes zero difference. They want you to get to the closing table and close because that's the end goal for everybody. So, okay. Whew. Um, so the short sale guide to success. Now we're going to talk about a little bit of what the, uh, what you need to know some uh, basics on how to work with short sales and how to be prepared. So when the debt against the subject property is, is more than what the property is worth, right? Now, don't look at just, oh, well, this is the market value and this is what's owed on the mortgage. It's deeper than that. There could be debt against the borrower via judgments. Those are all things that would need to be paid off. So what does that mean? You need to make sure that you obtain a title commitment from a, from a, a title search from a title company. And on there, it will detail out all of the debt that's, uh, that's um, against the property. Also, there might be liens against the property, violations against the property. So it's not just the mortgage debt, it's all the debt that may be attached to that property. So also when you are gonna start working with uh, uh, short sales, again, IMAP is a great tool. You guys can actually pull the information from IMAP on, any, uh, on the properties that have a list pendants filed and it will show you the case and the date um, you still need to verify the information. It's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty good for you to start working on it. And um, you can see once you get the case number, as I told you on the previous slides, you can actually look up the foreclosure process just to make sure you have enough time to get the foreclosure done. And a lot of times if you do have a legitimate buyer and you're running out of time, um, you can get an attorney that will go and ask for a, an extension to get that short sale date, the foreclosure sale date extended in order for you to be able to get a sale done. But in order to do that, you need to show proof that you do have a viable contract. Also for a short sale, just because you're in the red um, in terms of how much equity you have versus what it's worth, there must be a hardship. So um, you have to show that there's loss of income, uh, there could be a, you know, a death in the family, uh, a hardship that really caused you to be behind on your payments and you cannot afford anymore to carry this property forward. Um, you have to be behind in payments. And then in order to get the process started, the borrower must contact their lender to put them on notice and they will provide the short package. A lot of the stuff is available online, but if not, usually we'll fax you the package um, or we'll direct you on where it can be 
uh, where you can download the package to get the process started. It's a lot of information. So again, attention to detail is important with anything that we do as it relates to real estate. Um, and you'll be able to see everything that, that the bank will require. And then another thing that I recommend is get the borrower to authorize you to speak on their behalf. So that's another thing when they are calling the bank, they can ask uh, what is needed in order to get you to be able to speak on their behalf. And they will guide them and give them directions so that you can do that instead of getting your client more involved. Because sometimes, like I said, they're checked out. So you want to play that lead role and obtain the information directly from the source because timing is everything. And um, I, would, I would say that that's probably the, the, the best way to handle it, at least for me. I want to be in control, so uh, I know how to handle this. Um, once the process starts and you submit your paperwork, the bank will assign a processor. Okay, the, the processor basically is the intermediary between you and the negotiator. They will review all the documentation. They will make sure that everything that's needed is there. If not, they're gonna kick it back and you're gonna get back in line. So it's important to have everything that they require and then some in the package. Um, the process, the review process can take up to 30 days. It all depends on their workflow. Now, another thing which we don't like is that if you did get a uh, commission of 6% being paid as per your listing agreement, the banks may reduce that. It depends on case by case basis, but that's something that you need to be aware of. And then also if the property is within a condominium or an HOA, those fees, if there's anything owed, they may not pay the full amount. So they may only pay six months of that. So that's something that you may also need to negotiate the association in order to get it done. Now that is, so if you already know, um, you know that there is HOA fees due, that's something that you guys should include in the MLS so that any prospective buyer is aware that this is an additional item that may need to be negotiated. You also have to make sure that you disclose on your MLS listing, this sale is subject to third party approval. That's very important because just because you have a signed contract for the amount that the, that the seller agreed on, it's not up to them at the end of the day, it's up to the bank to decide. So that's why that disclosure is important. And of course, we need to include the short sale addendum as part of our package as well, contract package. Um, another great thing is that the bank may offer relocation assistance. So ask, if you don't ask, um, you may not receive. So definitely ask about that. Uh, and most of the times they do come through. So when you start working with short sales, it's important to have a team. Um, if you want to process your own short sale, that's great. You can do that um, or get yourself a processor. There's short sale processors. They do get paid a fee. And that's something that also would need to be included in the contract so that the bank sees and hopefully they approve the payment. Um, get yourself a title company or a, an attorney that specializes in short sales. They, because we'll need to provide several, several closing statements and be able to get you the information that you need at the speed of now, you need it now. So you definitely need to make sure you work with somebody that you trust and somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing, if you are working with an attorney or you're not working with an attorney, do some research, team up with an attorney and they could be a great referral source. So if you're good at what you do, they have other borrowers that are coming to them, to help them represent them in, in the foreclosure process. And they could be a good source of referrals for you. So do some research. Look in your neighborhood, who's an attorney, if you want to get into uh, working in short sales. And then you have your accountant and CPAs. Those are also very important, I think, for anything, for just regular real estate that we're handling, because there are some tax uh, implications that may arise from doing a short sale for the debt that's forgiven. So you need to make sure that your client, you're not giving them any kind of advice or any kind of assumptions, and you want them to direct all of that with an accountant or a CPA. Um, short sales do take time. However, you can lower the amount of time that it's gonna take you to get that approval if you are detailed. Um, but there are certain things that are out of our control. So if the banks are behind, it doesn't matter how detailed you are. You could be a little persistent. Maybe they'll bump you up a few people, but, um, but the short sale approval can, can be done in 30 days. I've seen it happen. I've done them myself. Uh, but again, you have to be detailed. You have to be persistent. So that way nothing slips through the cracks. 
And then it depends on you at the end of the day and the borrower and of course the bank. Um, also, what I recommend is if you are going to start working with a short sale, even, the, even before you list the property, don't wait to list to start working on it. Be, again, timing thing. So try to get all the documents from the borrower before you even list the property. So that you could be prepared. So the minute you get that offer, you're ready to get that submitted. That will definitely speed up the process. And again, guys, I mean, I can't stress this enough is the attention to details. That's your recipe for success. So please, you know, do yourself, a, your client a favor. We would, this will be a much better place if we're all more detailed on what we do just in general. That's great, and, Julie. Um, so everybody yeah. remember to double and triple check your work. It doesn't yeah. take that much time and it'll save you a ton of headaches in the long run. Yeah. We are running a bit late. Uh, does anybody have any questions? before we move on to the next uh, sponsor, before we get to Donia Diaz. Any questions? Julie, sorry to cut you off. Uh, no problem, thank you guys. This was incredible, thank you so much.